The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Going to do today is some kind of superficial overview and focusing on um, things that are important to consider when either designing experiments that probe binding or also when reading about experiments done by others um, and, and thinking about their data and how the data was fit. Um, so the readings this week were some excerpts from two different types of review articles, so the web paper and the Gaydrock paper. And I guess just to start, like, what, what did you think about these readings and the reviews, you know, kind of impressions, did you like them or, or not like them? How are they different? All that. I like the, I don't know, when they sort of went into certain considerations you need to keep in mind, that was kind of helpful. Okay. In the web, the one. The, in the web one. Um, it was like there was a 15 page one. Yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Great. Challenges of different, determining metal protein affinities. Okay. Okay, so that's good. A good good introduction to one one aspect of, of the field of metal homeostasis. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay, so what I would say in terms of why we selected excerpts from, from these two papers, um, one, as Alex mentioned, this review by WED, it's extremely comprehensive and the introductory parts give some really good, just brief and clear summary about considerations and pitfalls that happen when people are studying metal protein interactions. Um, and so right off the bat, there's an emphasis on you know, some important things to think about when either designing your own experiment or um, reading about experiments done by others. And then we didn't assign this whole paper, um, but one of the great things about this review article is that there's this systematic consideration of many different types of binding problems. And um, the considerations are applicable to more than just a metal protein interaction. But if you think about biochemistry in broad terms, there's many different types of binding problems. So um, it's just something to keep in mind for a resource um, if you ever need that down the road there. And then the other one is very much looking at, you know, biological system and competition between host and microbe for metal nutrients. And so there's a lot of questions involving um, metal protein thermodynamics, so what are relative affinities? Um, there's also questions about kinetics there that aren't, they're not really addressed in this. Um, but a lot of effort these days is going towards trying to understand these metal transport systems and also um, host defense factors that, that are involved in this tug of war. Um, and also it relates to um, topics that will come up in lecture, Joanne will be focusing on iron homeostasis and heme, but many of the concepts are similar. Um, and another nice thing about this Gidrock review, and it's something that will come up as we talk about um, binding experiments more, is this figure five. Um, so they're talking about a technique called isothermal titration calorimetry and using this method to determine binding affinities. And they've done a lot of simulations. Right? And so if you ever end up thinking about binding problems or doing experiments to look at binding, um, you can begin to have a qualitative appreciation for what data mean um, by studying simulations like this one or in the packet I've made, there's one looking at say optical absorption spectroscopy and what a titration curve will look at for different systems that have different affinities um, between a metal and a ligand there. So, Basically, what we'll do is consider um, just a simple one-to-one -one bimolecular complex in recitation today and talk about 
you know, thinking about determining a dissociation constant value, which is often how biochemists measure KD, um, different methods, and a lot of the things one needs to consider um, experimentally when, when studying metal protein equilibria. And again, many of these aspects apply to other types of binding problems. So it could be protein small molecule, protein protein interaction, protein DNA. Um, some are specific to metals because they have, have their unique characteristics and, and behavior. Okay, so if we think about a simple um, you know, bimolecular one-to-one -one complex, right? We have a metal, M, right? And often we think about a metal as being a Lewis acid, and then we have some ligand, and we can think of that as a Lewis base, okay, forming a complex. So ML, right? Um, often we talk about free versus bound. So free metal or free ligand is metal or ligand that's not complexed. Okay, versus bound because it's in a complex. Okay, and Today, we'll think about the ligand as being some protein that has a site for a metal, but it could also be a small molecule, um, for instance. Right, so in introductory chemistry, typically talk about affinity constants for equilibria. Um, in biochemical experiments, people often report affinity as a KD, so dissociation constant. Right, so if we think about the equation for KD, we have the concentration of the complex. I'm sorry, that's the Ka. Um, concentration of the metal ligand over the concentration of the complex. Okay. So the Kd also equals one over the Ka, and you can also think about the Kd in terms of a ratio of um, rate constants for dissociation and association here, K off over K on here, just as different ways to show this, right? So if we just look at this equation here, the units for a dissociation constant are concentration, right? So units, you know, it could be anything from millimolar, micromolar, nanomolar, et cetera. Here, right? And um, if we think about a system having increased affinity, so let's say the protein, the protein affinity is high, that is a lower KD. So a protein with a nanomolar KD value for a metal, that's higher affinity than a protein, say, with a micromolar or millimolar affinity for that metal here. So lower KD, higher affinity. Okay. So what is the common kind of data fitting that we might see in a textbook or in some experiments? We think about it as very similar to thinking about steady state kinetics in terms of um, the plot and the equation. Right, so imagine we have some protein, so we have our ligand, and we titrate in some metal, okay, just say plus two, and we have some measure of response to see formation of that complex. So maybe a, it has a color, like it's a protein that binds cobalt, and cobalt gives some new D to D transitions that we can monitor, um, or maybe it's some other, other method here. Okay, so we can have a response that tells us about formation of the complex versus the concentration of free metal here. And say we get something that looks like this. Okay. What we can say is that the response 
equals a constant times the concentration of free metal over the KD plus the concentration of free metal here, right? So effectively, we get the KD. Okay, so similar to thinking about KM in steady state kinetics, but keep in mind the KD and KM are two different things here, okay, for that. So if we think about this type of plot, and we think about setting up an experiment. So say we have a protein and we want to determine its affinity for some metal. Um, what do we need to know? The different concentrations of what you're putting in. Yeah, well that's for sure, right? So you need to know the concentration, one of the protein in your cuvette or in whatever sample hold you're using, and then the concentration of the metal you're titrating in, right? But beyond that, based on this equation, what do we need to know? You're trying to determine KD? Yeah. And we need to know M3. I'm not sure what D is. Yeah, so this is just, I mean, think back to steady state kinetics, right, be there. So, right, I'm just putting in as that because we don't know what this response is. But imagine you normalize the data to one, such that your maximum response is one, B would be one. Um, yeah, so metal free. So you just mentioned the concentration of metal you're adding in. So. Let's say you add in one micromolar of a metal and you have 10 micromolar of protein. What is your free metal concentration? Um, like you subtract the balance from the, the total metal. Yeah, right, so the total is the metal going in and then you have free and bound. Um, is it easy always to know what this is? Yeah, not, not always, right? So, and is there always free metal uh, available, right? So this is something we're gonna talk about um, a little bit moving forward. And so what we'll see is that this equation's great. Um, in many instances, it can't be used because we don't know what the free metal concentration is or we're in a regime where we don't have any free free metal concentration. Okay. Is this so, response a rate? Like in no. No, these these are thermodynamic measurements. All right. So this, let's say for instance, um, let's say that there's a system where in the absence of metal, it's colorless. Right, and wonder, one of the wonderful thing about many transition metal ions is that they give us color, right? So imagine you add in a metal and you end up getting some transition, okay? So perhaps this response is A max at each addition of metal, right? So some sort of colorimetric titration as one example. Um, you could also imagine using some sort of spectroscopy and say there's some specific signal for your metal-bound protein that differs from the free metal there, and then you could use that and quantify it. So for instance, EPR, NMR, um, any, any method like that, MCD here. So no, this is not a, um, a rate here. This is a response versus the concentration of free metal. And you see as the concentration of free metal increases, we're seeing an increase in whatever this observable is about the system here. Um, so let's just consider a case. Let's just say we have something like this, some UV-Vis titration. 
and we have our ligand, and we titrate in some metal. Okay, and how do we often plot this? Um, let's say we have the ratio of metal over the ligand, and here, let's say we have some change in absorbance, you know, at some wavelength, right? Like what we have here. Um, and we'll take one extreme case. So here, let's say you get data that looks like this. Okay, so you've done some titration, you've added some aliquot of metal, you let the solution equilibrate, and then you read the optical absorption spectrum. And so, what do we learn from something like this? So what do, what do we see in these data? Yeah, so something's happening here, right? So what we see is that over this regime, which as I've drawn this, right, we have a ratio of metal to ligand of one. We see that, you know, this change in absorption occurs, right? It's quite linear. And then once we hit a ratio of one to one, we see that there's no more increase in absorbance at that wavelength that plateaus. So, so what does that tell us about the interaction between this protein and the metal? Yeah, right, this tells us something about stoichiometry, first of all, that for whatever is causing this particular change in the spectrum, we see that change happens to one equivalent of metal and stops, which gives indication of a one-to-one -one stoichiometry here. What else does this tell us? So if you see something like this, um, what's happening in terms of this free metal concentration over this regime? So when there's less than one equivalent of metal added, where is that metal? Yeah, right, it's with the protein, so it's bound. Effectively, this is evidence for some sort of high affinity complex because what you see is that the um, absorbance change occurs up to one equivalent and then it stops, right? So we can contrast that to something like, you know, a case where it's more of a curve like what we see up here where it takes more than one equivalent of metal to say sat to saturate that site. Okay, in this case, maybe it's one to one stoichiometry, maybe it's something else, right? You need to do some more experiments to see. So if I say this is some high affinity complex, So we have no or negligible concentration of free metal. Um, question one is what does high affinity mean in terms of a range of KD? And secondly, if there's no free metal, what are we going to do um, in terms of determining a KD value? All right. So what do we think of as high affinity binding? Animals. Yeah, so that's pretty good, right? Um, right, nanomolar or lower KD. So something like this, what happens if you see data like this is that typically um, you'll say, okay, this indicates we have a one-to-one -one complex 
and the dissociation constant has an upper limit that's typically in the regime of 10 nanomolar. So that's as the upper limit, right? It could be orders of magnitude lower, but we can't see that in these data here. Um, and so that's something to watch out for when looking at how people analyze binding data, because sometimes a KD is reported as an absolute value um, from a direct titration. So this is what I would call a direct titration. Okay, meaning that we only have the ligand here and the metal is titrated in or whatever the binding partner is. Okay, but if you're in a regime where you're just getting an upper limit, that value is just an upper limit. And it could be one nanomolar, it could be 10 picomolar, it could be femtomolar. There's some more experiments that need to be done um, to sort that out here. So um, let's just say we have a case where um, this KD is one nanomolar, okay? Um, thinking about this and what we know from steady state discussions earlier in this course, and again, this isn't the same thing, but some of the same ideas apply. What, what concentration regime would you wanna set up the experiment? So say you think your protein has a KD of for a metal of one nanomolar what concentration of protein do you want to use in the titration? Like high picomolar. High picomolar. So why would you want high picomolar, and what does high picomolar mean? Because um, I think otherwise you wouldn't be able to resolve the, the dissociation. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So typically you want to be a little, you want to be around your KD. So if the KD is one nanomolar, you want to be a bit below or a bit above. And if you're really being rigorous, try a few different concentrations, right? Because at the end of the day, this response should be independent of that within a range of error. So, so what's the issue? Let's say your KD is one nanomolar, or for that matter, one picomolar, and you'd like to set up an experiment, and you need an observable for this response. So this gets back to some of what Joanne talked about in recitations two and three, and needing a detectable signal in the um, pre-study state kinetic experiments that you have to work with a high concentration of protein to see something. And so that becomes the same issue here, right? If your system would allow you to work at one nanomolar or one picomolar to have an observable, right, you would be in a range where you can, can see something other than this, right? But often, whatever we're observing, we need to work at a high protein concentration, right? Because the extinction coefficient is weak, um, or we just need a high concentration for whatever the type of signal is, um, which is what can put us in this, this regime here. So that's something to think about. So what can be done um, in order to get more information than what's shown here um, for a high affinity site? So let's say you're not able to work at a concentration that's appropriate, you know, based on the KD of this high affinity site, that you need to work at a higher concentration. Um, what can be done. So effectively, what is often done is what I'll call an indirect approach. Okay, another way this is described is to set up a competition titration. where you take your ligand or protein of interest, you take a competitor 
and you titrate in the metal. Okay, so what is this competitor? Typically, it's a small molecule. Okay, with a known affinity. So a known KD um, for the metal of interest. Okay, under the experimental conditions you're using. Here. Okay. And so there's different flavors of using a competitor. Um, and I'll just highlight a few in passing. So one way to use a competitor is to use some small molecule ligand that allows you to buffer the free metal concentration. Um, so in these cases, it's some sort of um, system that will not affect the readout of, say, metal binding to your protein. So you can imagine, for instance, using EDTA, um, EGTA, NTA, like what's on the uh, and I, uh, nickel NTA columns for affinity chromatography. And there are published affinity constants for these small molecules for different metals. And so you can set up a metal ion buffering system. And so the idea is that in addition to your normal buffer, and we'll talk about more about buffers in a minute, you have a very high total concentration of metal and a high total concentration of a chelator. And you can make these buffers such that the buffer will buffer the free metal concentration. So you can buffer free metal, say, in the nanomolar or sub-nanomolar regime. So what does this mean? Your total metal concentration and total concentration of this competitor is much higher than the concentration of your protein. And so when you introduce you know, you set up your titration, you have the protein in this buffer system, the pr protein will bind some of the metal, and then the buffer will adjust such that the free metal ion concentration you've set it at remains the same. Okay, so that gives you a way to get free, free metal concentrations. Um, another approach that's often used, you know, it's, it's also controlling your overall metal concentration, but in a bit, bit of a different way, is to take a competitor that is also some sort of colorimetric or um, fluorescent indicator of the metal. And so, in effect, what you do is you use the competitor as a readout um, for competition in the assay. And so, what you can do is ask, okay, under these conditions, when the metal binds to the protein, there's no change in absorbance or fluorescence at some wavelength, but there will be a change from the competitor at that wavelength. So if you put these together, you can ask, okay, as the metal is titrated in, where does the metal go? Do we see a response from the competitor or not? If not, it tells you that the protein won. If yes, and it's the same as the competitor in the absence of the protein, the competitor won, right? So those are two cases of out competition where either the protein out competes this competitor or the competitor out competes the protein. That's not very helpful for actually determining an apparent uh, dissociation constant value. It will give you something information about limits here. But what you really want to have happen, and as this name suggests, is that you want the protein and um, this competitor to compete. So effectively, you see the response of the competitor attenuated compared to the response in the absence of protein. So some metals here, some metals there. And then what you can do is a mathematical analysis to fit that data based on knowing the affinity of the competitor for the metal and knowing the concentrations of the competitor in the ligand here. Okay, so this is something that Wed talks about quite a bit in his, the review that was assigned um, in terms of setting up these competition titrations here. 
And so when done, done well, that can really be quite powerful here for that. Um, and there's many other themes and variations about how, how to do that. But um, it's just to keep in mind if your binding event is too tight to measure by a direct titration, you want to think about a way to do a competition titration here. So in the packet, um, I put in an excerpt from a paper that was published in 2003 showing some titration curves like what I sketched here, um, where there's some response to indicate how much is bound versus some concentration of metal. And one of the reasons I really like this plot is that it gives a qualitative sense for KD values over a range of magnitudes and what that curve would look like here. And just having a sense of this qualitatively gives you a lot of leverage in terms of just looking at data and analyzing it, whether it's your own or someone else's in terms of is this a high affinity site, is this a low affinity site um, there. Likewise, in this Gidrock review with a different type of method called ITC here. Um, OK, so what we're going to do is talk a little bit about um, some general concepts and then some general considerations for, say, setting up these types of experiments. Um, and so some of this relates to concepts in class. So Joanne talked about the Irving Williams series, right? So based on that series, if you're, say, looking at some protein and you're interested, say, in the KD for binding of manganese versus zinc, what would you expect qualitatively? So imagine each of these metals is bound at the same site. Right, and today in class we talked about the different types of ligands that proteins use, right? So histidines or carboxylates or maybe a cysteine. Right, we'll leave tyrosine out for the moment. Cause, um, but what, what would we expect? Which metal will bind with higher affinity based on Irving Williams? The zinc, right? So as we march along the first row from manganese, you know, we see that the affinity increases and copper can bind with higher affinity than zinc. So there's a swap at the end, right? So that's what we would expect. Um, so what does that mean just in terms of reading something in the literature, right? If someone's reporting binding affinities for a protein and you see that the values are of a similar order of magnitude for manganese and zinc, you might want to scratch your head a little bit and ask what's going on, right? So is it a case where both metals are bound tightly? and the titration didn't resolve a difference, right? Because you're just at an upper limit. Is there something unusual about this site that is causing the selectivity to be contrary to what we expect based on the Irving Williams series um, there? So the point is you can use those generalities as a guide. And there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, I missed class on Wednesday. Did you go over hard, soft, acid, base? So have any of you heard about this hard, soft, acid, base concept? No, no. Yes, yeah, so like what's a hard, hard, soft, acid, base theory? Like, um, so like smaller, um, more electronegative things will associate those with like hard, hard things, like hard things. Yeah. Like larger, fluffier atoms that will associate with those. How's an atom fluffy? <laughs> no, right. So that pull, pull, <laughs> think about um, how polarizable it is, but yeah. that's along the right track. So basically, we can classify different metals and different ligands as being relatively hard or relatively soft, right? And then there can be the gray area in the middle, which is called borderline. Um, so if we think about, say, you know, a metal ion that's a hard Lewis acid, that's something like calcium, for instance, iron three. Um, 
these types of metals like oxygen donors, which are hard bases, for instance. Um, you know, often it's metal in a high oxidation state, if that's an option, so iron three versus iron two. Iron three is more hard. Um, they're not very polarizable. Um, and so often hard metals are bound by hard acids. So an example like Joanne brought up in terabactin today in class, and if you remember the structure from when we talked about siderophore biosynthesis, it uses six oxygen donors to bind iron three. So from hard soft acid base theory, that's a sensible ligand set. Um, on the other extreme, what's, what's soft? So that's a soft acid, some metal with a large ionic radius. So if we think about like to the right in the periodic table, mercury, cadmium, copper one, and they like soft ligands like cysteine. So sulfur, that's quite polarizable. Um, so soft, typically lower oxidation state, more to the right in the periodic table. Um, and then you get metals that are in the middle, like zinc, iron two, cobalt two, there. Um, so this gives you some indication of a guide. And just why I bring this up is, you know, we've talked about the Irving Williams series, but depending on the ligand set, that series might not make sense, right? So something like an EF tan domain that binds calcium ions, it uses many oxygen donors. It's going to prefer calcium, say, over copper, even though calcium is in another place in the periodic table and also not defined by that, formally defined by the Irving Williams series there. Okay, so that's something you can keep in mind when, when analyzing the data just qualitatively, right? And so in the Giedrock review, um, if you look at those data, it's a case in many of the systems where you know, what's currently reported or reported at that time are KD values that are similar um, for certain metals that are separated along the first row, right? So then the question is, what, what's really going on? And some of it is um, an issue related to methods and um, experimental design in terms of finding conditions that allow high affinity binding to be studied here. So let's consider just some, some practical considerations in terms of experiments. Um, as we go forward. So in the beginning of this web paper, he talks about a bunch of pitfalls that can come up in terms of experimental design. Do any of you recall what some of these, these problems are? You know, um, you know, when he brings up on page, well, page two, you know, reliable evaluation and comparison of metal binding affinities is important for quantitative understanding of metal selection and speciation, right? So that's central to everything that Joanne has been talking about in terms of homeostasis the past few days in lecture. And then what does he say? You know, however, estimation of these metal binding constants is problematic at the moment as desperate values have been reported in the literature, right? And then he highlights a few um, examples that are illustrative of this wider, wider problem here, right? And so what's striking about some of the, these issues he shows in that page two um, of this review? Did these things concern you when, when reading the review? So what do these these highlight in general? Yeah. So in terms of right in Wed's paper, he begins this paper by citing a number of examples of problems in the literature. And I guess I'm asking, were these was were these problems striking to you? And if so, why? And really what is the issue, generally the issue here? I feel like there's such like a Yeah. Right. So these values are hugely different that he's citing here, right? I mean, 
10 orders of magnitude different, you know, reported KDs that vary by six orders of magnitude, right? These are huge differences. This isn't, you know, one nanomolar versus 10 nanomolar. This is hugely different, and depending on what number you come up with, there's huge implications for what that means in a biological system, right? So what are some of the reasons for why there may be so many discrepancies, right? And in each case, we don't really know, but what we're gonna do now is just think about some of the aspects of experimental setup that might be affecting, uh, you know, determination of one of these values um, and how to think about these things. So, like, in terms of pitfalls, I'll begin with one, which is just fitting the data in an inappropriate manner, right? So there's so many programs out there that will fit data, but at the end of the day, you need to ask, what does this fit mean? Is it meaningful for the system that's being studied, right? So did it take into account all parameters? Is it the correct stoichiometry? Do the numbers that come out make sense? what other experiments can be done to try to test that there. Um, and so that's a general issue. And then as I've you know, mentioned here in passing, often direct titrations are fit inappropriately because this is concluded to mean some absolute KD when it doesn't. Okay, it just gives you a limit here. So what about, let's just think about taking a protein and titrating it with an, in, a metal. Right, that experiment will happen in a buffer. So do we need to think about the buffer? Yeah, but then there could be like two layers here, pure metal that you're considering. Right, so that's the first question. Does the buffer influence metal speciation in um, the cuvette by having some affinity for the metal of interest? So from that perspective, what buffers could be classified as problematic. So you need to think about the chemical composition, the chemical structure of the buffer. EDTA or something? Yeah, okay, so EDTA could be in your buffer for some reason, but that's not your buffer, right? So the buffer is what's going to control the pH there. So, so TRIS is an example. What are other examples of common buffers? Bis -tris. Yeah, bis-tris, others. Yeah, PBS, so a phosphate buffer that's often used um, in like tissue culture experiments and other experiments. So let's start with the TRIS buffer. Um, is it a good idea to do a metal binding titration where you want to get a KD um, in TRIS buffer? Taking head no, so why? Yeah, okay, so, right, let's break, break that down. So one, TRIS, that has an affinity for certain metals, right? You have an amine-based buffer. So that's one issue. And then the other thing you need to think about in this are what are the relative concentrations of the buffer to your protein of interest, right? So what's the typical TRIS buffer concentration used, say, in protein purification or some type of experiment? Yeah, typically higher than one millimolar too, right? So maybe 20, 75 millimolar, maybe even higher than that, right? So you have this substantial concentration of your TRIS buffer compared to a protein concentration, um, which if you have a micromolar KD, you'd like to look at a micromolar range, that range of protein, right? So that will influence the metal binding equilibria in the experiment, right? So then the question is, if you're doing the titration under that type of condition, are you taking that tris metal interaction into account in the data analysis, right? Um, are there other buffers that are arguably more appropriate? And the answer is yes. So there's buffers like heaps. Um, these are buffers that are called good, good buffers, Zwitter ionic buffers that you know, in general have lower metal affinities and are often used for um, titrations. What about, say, um, metal contamination from the buffer or from the water? So what's important to think about there? Yeah. 
Is that an issue? Yeah, right, so you need to think about the water. You know, where did this water come from? Where did your tris come from or whatever other buffer, right? Because again, if you have a 100 millimolar buffer, it's not only the molecules of, say, heaps, but it's whatever other contaminants are in there. And there's a lot more of that than your protein, right? Which gets into this, you know, issue of Irving Williams series and zinc. So zinc contamination is everywhere. Zinc, zinc is everywhere. So are you getting a zinc contamination, say, and your metal binding protein, some portion of it is complexing zinc, and you can't see that because zinc is spectroscopically silent, right? Um, that's going to be a problem. So that's something to think about and keep in mind. So for rigorous work, um, High purity buffers can be used, um, or there are tricks out there to demetallate buffers. Um, those tricks often have a few caveats as well for that, but um, think contamination is something to keep in mind um, and can be a bit of a nuisance, but you just need to know how to look for it and deal with it. And I mean, also, these contaminations, it becomes an issue too in terms of what is your protein concentration. Right, so if you have a one micromolar metal contamination and you're working with one millimolar protein, it's probably okay, right? But if you're working with you know, one or 10 micromolar protein, then there's a problem, right? Because you're gonna have more of that complexed there. So why are we using the buffer? We're using the buffer to control pH, right? So how do we wanna think about pH from the standpoint of these titrations? You don't want to coordinate something that you are trying to coordinate the metal with, so mm -hmm. the protein coordinates with some acidic side chains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or even histidine, right? That has a pKa that um, you know is in, a, in the regime, right? And cysteine, right? That, that has a pKa. So you know, often we think about the pH of the buffer used in protein purification that will make the protein stay you know, in a happy state. Um, but then the question is, you know, is that pH appropriate for the metal binding study? What is the effect of that pH on the ligands in the primary coordination sphere? So are they protonated or deprotonated or a mixture of the two? And then how does that affect the affinity itself, right? So these KDs will have a pH dependence based on um, pKa's of the side chains here. And I mean, also, are there pH requirements for the metal? And is your experimental setup such that the pH remains constant throughout the titration, right? So an example, iron three, right? So Joanne talked about iron three in class today and this ridiculously low KSP at pH 7 of 10 to the minus 18, right? You can't just have your iron 3 stock solution at pH 7 and have much of anything soluble, right? So what do people do about that? Often the stock solution is stored in acid because it's soluble there, right? Um, can you titrate that acidic solution directly into your protein, right? These are just things, things to think about here. What else can be in the buffer? So thinking about anyone who's purified protein. So you brought up EDTA, right? And that certainly would be something that would need to be taken into account, right? Hopefully you would only have it present if you wanted to do something like a competition, right? Otherwise that's gonna be a major um, issue, right? In terms of sorting things out. But what, what else might be in the buffer? So what if your protein, say, is a cytoplasmic protein and it has a lot of cysteines? Are those cysteines likely to be reduced or oxidized in the native form if it's a cytoplasmic protein? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, reduced, right? Because that's a reducing environment. And then you go into the periplasm or the ER, which is where um, you find proteins that have more disulfide bonds. So let's say your protein likes to have a bunch of reduced cysteines in it, right? Chances are you have a reducing agent in the buffer you use for protein purification. And maybe you need to keep that reducing agent around during an experiment, or maybe you can work in an anaerobic chamber and get rid of it. But let's just say the reducing agent's present. Is that something we need to think about from the standpoint of a metal protein interaction? So what are examples of these reducing agents? TSEPs one, yeah. Um, and we'll come back to that one in a minute. What are some others? Yeah, then what else? Another thiol based reducing agent commonly used in protein purification. DTT, yeah. Oh, DTT. DTT, right. So let's just consider say DTT and BME together, right? Are, is there something we need to consider there? Yes, because depending on your metal, these reducing agents will have some affinity, right? And often they're in very large excess over the concentration of protein. So it's a similar issue to like the TRIS buffer issue in terms of how are these reducing agents affecting metal speciation and metal binding equilibria in the experiment. Okay, so TSEP, this is um, triscarboxyethylphosphine, so not as commonly used in protein purification, but it is, it is a reducing agent that you commonly see used in um, certain metal binding titrations, and that's because it's thought to cause less interference, right? So the affinity, uh, that equilibrium constant um, is much weaker. So what is one of the pitfalls of using TSEP that people often run into, Juno. So if you just have TSEP in aqueous solution, you're going to start what? reducing just if you leave it there. Well, it needs something to reduce, right? Water. So if you just have TSEP in water, is that neutral, basic, acidic? Yeah, so it's acidic, and the manufacturer instructions say this pretty explicitly, but oftentimes they go unread, right? So if you end up working with quite a bit of TSEP in your experimental conditions, the first thing you need to ask is, is the buffer adequate to buffer uh, the pH when TSEP's added, right? You don't want the TSEP acidifying your buffer, and then you're not working at the pH you think you're working at. So what does that mean? You might want to pH adjust your TSEP solution before um, starting the experiment there. That's just something to keep in mind. I've seen that happen many, many times in terms of the TSEP there. Okay. Temperature control, right? The equilibrium constant's temperature dependent. So what is the temperature control? throughout one experiment, and then also if you're repeating this experiment over multiple days, right, because you want to get um, error analysis and show that it's reproducible, is that temperature good for that? Um, so those are some key things. And then, I mean, what do we need to think about in terms of using a competitor when setting up the experiment? So one, we need to know the KD value of the competitor for the metal of interest, right? And hopefully we know something about this system so we can make an appropriate choice, right? Because as I said before, we want to see competition there. Um, what could go wrong, right? And again, this isn't meant to be all gloom and doom. This is just, you know, you need to be aware of certain things that can happen in your experiments and know to look out for them so you can um, fix things as necessary, right? So what here, we have the protein, we have the competitor, we have the metal, right? And as I've described it, we want the protein and the competitor to operate 
effectively independent of one another, right? So they can both find the metal, and somehow this metal is going to be distributed between the two uh, based on the relative concentrations and the relative KDs. So what could muck that up? That's the ideal scenario. Well, we definitely know they both can, right? Simultaneously. Simultaneously. Yeah. So what would that be called? Yeah, so th this can be a major headache, right? Is what happens is that you get what's called a ternary complex, right? So you have the ligand, the competitor, and the metal as one. So imagine that your protein has a metal site that's not coordinatively saturated Right? And so as a result, maybe you have the metal in this site, but then the competitor also binds. Okay, that's not good from the standpoint of setting up this competition, right? Because how do you parameterize for that? Um, so that, that can be a big issue and something that you need to watch out for when designing the experiments. Could something happen between the competitor and the protein itself in the absence of metal? Yeah, it could block or perturb, right? Um, so what might happen? I mean, we can just imagine a scenario where this protein has some hydrophobic patch, right? And maybe this competitor has a fluorophore that's relatively hydrophobic, or maybe part of the ligand is hydrophobic, and so you end up getting the competitor sticking to the protein. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean the competitor won't bind the metal, but it will perturb how that competitor behaves. It could perturb the optical readout. It could perturb the metal affinity of the competitor. Um, so that's something to also watch out for. All right, so we talked about like the buffer and contaminations in the buffer. Um, what about the competitor here? So typically these small molecules are coming from some commercial source, right? And so you have similar issues, even though you're using a much smaller concentration. Um, and so don't always assume what you're getting is as pure as they tell you, right? And that could be organic impurity, or it could be a metal contamination because these competitors are ligands, right? And they could have picked up some metal along the way. Um, so, what can be problematic from the standpoint of, say, organic impurity here? Like one common example is that if you're using something that's fluorescent or like brightly colored to have an optical readout, um, maybe there's an impurity that wasn't removed in the synthesis and purification that's also very bright, right? So you have something that's compromising the optical signal of the probe. Right, and then there's also the possibility, since these are ligands, that there's a contaminant that can also bind a metal, right? So if there was some byproduct that wasn't fully removed during purification, if that's the case, it will influence speciation as well there. Um, so what does one do um, in terms of gold standard and testing, you need to know what the primary literature is about this competitor molecule and then effectively test your sample and make sure it has the expected optical properties and the expected behavior um, when binding the metal of interest. And if that all looks good, then can move forward, right? Also just typical um, tests of purity like you know, LCMS, HPLC, um, even with many of these, if they're highly colored, a simple TLC will give you a lot of information there. Um, so I'll close with that and just would reiterate broadly that a lot of the topics discussed in the web review and in the packet, um, although from the perspective of metals and proteins, it's more general um, to any type of binding problem. And if you need more resources in terms of like binding problems related to metals, I highly recommend reviews by Wilcox and Giedrock, in addition to this review um, by WED there. So they talk um, a lot about you know, aspects of experimental design and certain methodologies there.